Hello and welcome to the first AFOX Digital in SACA this academic year. A very warm welcome to all the new students and those who are joining us for the first time. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Now, the digital in SACAs have been running since the lockdown. In better times, in SACAs were face-to-face -face talks held at St. Cross College, and we remain ever so grateful to the master of the college, Carol Suter. We have now gone digital and most, and, the, and we host them on a monthly basis. Talks cover all areas of academia and attract experts in the topics discussed, as well as a much broader audience um, interested in all things Africa. My job here today is very simple. I'm here to introduce the speakers and the topics, and my name is Watu. Our first talk today is on what it would take to see a pipeline of treatments and therapies emerge from Africa. This I think is a very exciting and thought provoking talk because it invites us to engage with fundamental frameworks of thought. And in fact, it is particularly topical for the Black History Month. We often hear about decolonizing the mind, decolonizing education, this talk offers a perspective on decolonizing medicine. The second talk, and this is a slight departure for, from the usual talks, in that it's not about a specific piece of academic research per se, it's about AFOX. What in actual fact is AFOX and how did it come about? What really is the point of it and what does it actually do? This we hope will be useful to students who have just joined Oxford and those joining us for the first time. And I suspect also those who have been engaging with us on a frequent basis because it also brings us up to speed on current activities at AFOX and its achievements so far. We are delighted to welcome our guest speakers today. Caesar Atriri and our two AFOX colleagues, Anne and Mora. Caesar is senior lecturer at the Department of Philosophy and Classics at the University of Ghana. His research interests include bioethics, politics of development in Africa, and personhood in philosophy. We know Caesar well. He was an AFOX visiting fellow in 2018. And during his time in Oxford, collaborated with colleagues at the Department of Psychiatry and the Wellcome Center for Ethics and Humanities to study attitudes that inform the way people perceive mental health in West Africa. His work led to a culturally attuned framework of bioethical concepts to address complex challenges facing the understanding and treatment of people with mental disorders in Ghana. After his AFOX visiting fellowship, Caesar went on to publish a book titled Bioethics in Africa. The book offers diverse theoretical and practical perspectives on bioethical challenges that are common in Sub-Saharan Africa. Caesar has also been more recently the recipient of an All Souls College visiting fellowship and returned to Oxford earlier this year. He also now holds an AFOX research grant that extends his work on mental health in Ghana and is looking to develop viable options for accessing local mental health care. Caesar is also the founder and president of an NGO that engages with over 30,000 people across Ghana every year, delivering vocational training and health to marginalized community. Caesar is firmly convinced of the importance of going back into African philosophy, yes, African philosophy, to find critical insights and offer concrete solutions to existing challenges, as well as provide an African voice to the global discourse. Caesar will give a 15 minute talk and right after his presentation, he will respond to your questions. So please post your questions in the chat box as he gives his talk so that we can dive straight into a Q&A with him right after his presentation. I will introduce the other two speakers in the second half of the hour after Caesar's Q&A session. So now on to Caesar's talk. Why the world will not have an African herbal medicine cure or vaccine for COVID-19. Caesar, over to you. 
Great. Thank you very much, Watu. Uh, thanks for this uh, introduction. Um, I'm really honored to have this opportunity to share with you some thoughts on the frameworks that actually you know, inform the way medicines are regulated and how they actually enter into distribution in the African continent. And um, I'm particularly grateful to our, our folks. Uh, I've participated in some of the live in circus at, um, at Oxford, and um, they usually create moments to get to meet, share ideas, but I think this uh, online format is also very useful. So um, let me try to start off my presentation by telling a story. Unfortunately, 15 minutes for um, to present philosophical ideas is particularly challenging. So I'll ask everybody who's listening to bear with me if uh, some of the arguments are a little bit choppy and I'm jumping over ideas as I go along. Now, the story I want to tell is about uh, a boy who was born 50 years ago in Northern uh, Ghana. He was born through a cesarean section, so his mother couldn't take care of him in the first days of his life. A maid was supposed to be helping, and the maid was inexperienced. So the maid lifted the boy by yanking a shoulder, and he had a dislocated shoulder. This condition stayed with the boy for about 10 years in his life. The boy's father, John, was a, a biomedical health worker, trained under the colonial system, and a practicing Roman Catholic who worked at the local Catholic missionary hospital. Of course, John, the boy's father, believed that traditional medicine was witchcraft. It was primitive. And so he would not take the boy to see a traditional healer. The boy was taken to many of the hospitals in Ghana, but the situation continued. Somewhere around the age of 10, <clears throat> when the boy's parents were away, the boy entered into a fight with some of his friends and his shoulder was dislocated again. The maid, taking advantage of the fact that the parents were not around, dashed and rushed the boy to the local healer, Afulimi. This healer um, went to the back of his house, took some herbs, mixed them with shea butter oil and some other chemicals or uh, portions that we do not know what they are, massaged the boy's shoulder for about half an hour. The boy was totally relaxed. He felt completely relaxed. When he was relaxed, a fully me hit the boy's shoulder and the dislocation, the dislocated shoulder fell into place. After that, he applied further creams, used a type of um, um, POP, like the one you can see in the image here, to hold the boy's shoulder, and the boy has been well since. Afulimi didn't charge any money. He received a chicken in exchange for his services. Now, today, Afulimi is dead. His practice no longer lives. One of his sons tried to continue with this practice, but unfortunately, the regulations that were set up by the government to be able to register and become a recognized practitioner of traditional medicine were so rigorous and onerous that the family couldn't afford it. And this whole practice has disappeared. So today, what we can say is that therapeutically, a fully made the traditional healer actually won. But in terms of health systems, John, the biomedical health care worker won because the clinic, the missionary clinic, which where he was working, Today is a large hospital and is thriving. Now, the boy um, in, at the center of this story is actually the person who's talking to you right now. This is what leads me to make this reflection about how we can harness the resources of traditional medicine and how we also run the risk of losing a patrimony of knowledge through omission if not through commission, through commission. But I just want to look at um, something from uh, the colonial model that we inherited as African nations living, or African countries, I wouldn't say nations, countries, living in the post-colonial era. I mean, throughout history, um, biomedicine 
and by medical knowledge, especially in the colonial era, was retained to be more useful, more modern than the local alternatives. And institutions were set to organize the population in such a way that um, biomedicine, and Western biomedicine would have a privilege. This is a question of actually determining what is knowledge and how to classify knowledge. And within this framework, other forms of knowledge were often looked at as witchcraft, belief, and non-knowledge, simply because they did not fit into that model. Now, this is what many African countries inherited. So traditional medicine was not what you find when you go to a hospital in Africa. When you go to a hospital in Africa, you receive, uh, you're received by nurses, doctors who are trained according to the Western biomedical model, like John, my father, was trained according to that tradition. And he was trained rigorous, rigorously to believe that other forms of medical um, health care were not as qualified or were not as valid as the training he had received. However, this model is gradually changing. And uh, to move on quickly, what we now have is that in the post-colonial era, there is a great drive actually towards an assimilation of traditional medicine, traditional herbal medicine. According to the WHO 2019 report, Africa is actually doing significantly better than many regions when it comes to giving value and giving space to traditional uh, medicine, tra traditional herbal medicine. There are also challenges, and these challenges include uh, lack of financial support, lack of data to actually know what is included in traditional medicine because there's not enough research going in traditional herbal, in traditional herbal uh, research. There are also bureaucratic challenges that we will be looking at. However, um, I just want to focus on the word that I've used here. I've used the word post-colonial assimilation model. Now, let's keep in mind that assimilation is different to integration. Assimilation means that what we're trying to do is that we're trying to make traditional medicine similar to Western biomedicine. So from that perspective, we begin to actually judge and, va and value traditional medicine according to how it fits into the Western biomedical model. It is no wonder that even in official documents, as recently as 2005 in Ghana anyway, we still see traditional medicine being referred to as alternative medicine. If it is alternative, then it is alternative to something, and that is the standard, and that is being applied, that is being implied. This is a model that is not an, a model that is not necessarily a model that is integrative, because integrate means to add up, integer is to bring together. But it is one thing to integrate systems, and it's another thing to assimilate them. Now, um, I'll just move on. It is important to keep in mind when we're talking about traditional medicine is that, uh, that medicine, even Western biomedicine, Eastern Chinese medicine, um, African medicine, is generated and the knowledge is created within a cultural context. And that cultural context has a way of understanding health. And here, I just wanted to bring a few, um, we could cite even more, there's a lot of literature on this, but I'm just picking up a few um, examples to show you. Badejisin, the Nigerian philosopher, when he talks about the Yoruba word for health, alafia, which is also similar to the, Hav the Hausa word, lafia, talks about something that means more than physical health. It refers to a person's social, psychological, and spiritual well-being. And a person uh, cannot claim to be healthy unless these elements are actually all functioning. And it is interesting that Badejisin breaks the word disease into two to say that disease is actually a question of this and ease. So when a person is ill at ease, the person is suffering from a disease. And this can be physical, physiological, it can refer to the social dimensions, and it can also be psychological or metaphysical. Now, 
And this is also even very interesting today in the COVID era when we are beginning to think more about the social determinants of health. And we've suddenly realized that these are very important and not just, um, we should not only just focus on individual physiological health. Secondly, um, the elements that African, the African concept of health that informs traditional medicine is also about the notion of disease. And um, Bigman writes very well, I mean, this is a very old text, but it's classic, he says, African medicine does not primarily treat diseases, but sick people. Um, if you ask many traditional healers in Africa, they will not be able to write a thesis on a disease, but they can give you um, a whole history of how people react to the disease. So the battle is not so much about eliminating a disease, conquering a disease, but it is about getting people well. So it's a person-centered for, I mean, it's a person-centered uh, way of practicing medicine. And then thirdly, Abraham, William Abraham talks about the fact that, yes, there is diagnosis, there's prognosis of diseases that you can actually find the etiology of any uh, condition from physical sources, but one also needs to look to the metaphysical causes, the non-physical causes that are actually at the root of this disease. So here, what we see is that traditional medicines are born within a context that has a social holistic understanding of health. It is person-centered and it is open to a metaphysical notion of health. Now, how does this epistemic framework of health feed into, fit into the modern criteria that we use to, uh, to value medicines? Recently, the CDC Africa published um, a document to help member states of um, the African Union and the WHO on how to um, regulate so-called uh, so cures for corona, because as you know, um, all across the continent, many people have come up with um, possible cures for, the, uh, for corona. And so, interestingly, one still sees the epistemic model of biomedicine at work. The, um, the, the regional director for WHO Africa says that, yeah, any COVID therapy must be based on science. And the, WHO's, the WHO special representative says, it is rigorous clinical testing as done with other types of medicine. So what we're saying is that we're trying to assimilate traditional medicine, but traditional medicine has to conform to the standards that have been set by biomedicine. Therefore, when we're looking for proofs, we do not, we're not interested in beliefs. We're looking for things that are measurable and replicable. Testimony as a source of knowledge is not considered here. And this is something that philosophically we could actually debate because I mean, testimony can be a source, an epistemic, a valid epistemic source of knowledge. Whereas here, we're looking more towards a physicalist and, and empirical uh, verification of sources of knowledge. This means that traditional herbal medicines would have to submit themselves to this particular criteria in order to be able to emerge. And if they do not emerge, unfortunately, the normative systems of many countries is such that they are actually prohibited. So, for example, in Ghana, if a, a herbal medicine has not been approved by the Food and Drug Organization uh, Authority or tested by the Ghana Standards Authority, this cannot be marketed, it cannot be circulated, and it is considered a false medicine. Now, the fact is this, normative systems or normative frameworks are not just um, regulatory, but they also have a power to create spaces and realities. They have a performative function. And one of the results of the, this type of normative framework of imposing if, um, an epistemic framework that is not exactly compatible with the epistemic framework within which these medicines are generated has created the emergence of a new figure across the African continent that one finds whom I call the neo-herbalists. 
The new herbalists are the ones that we see with their cars, with their big posters, and they are the ones who are actually selling new type of herbal medicines. Most of them have learned the rules of the game. And are you saying two more minutes or? All right, I just saw it two on my screen. <laughs> no. um, but anyway, most of them have learned the rules of the game. They even dress in white medical coats. Some of them carry stethoscopes. And it is, they have turned herbal medicine into a profit-driven activity, which means that they will invest in those medicines that they think will be able to sell. Now, sometimes, because these medicines are not fully verified, a lot of these medicines actually enter into the realm of what is called fake medicines. And in exposing these fake medicines, there's an example of um, an investigative journalist from Ghana, Anas, who did um, um, a piece on uh, Corona quacks, where he exposes some of these new herbalists who were selling so-called cures to COVID. Of course, the thing is, these are people who are neither traditional herbalists nor Western biomedical uh, practitioners. They sit in the middle because of the normative divide, which is based on an epistemic, um, an inadequate epistemic uh, framework. Then in exposing these figures, we actually reinforce the bias against traditional medicines because these guys say they're selling traditional herbal medicines and it reinforces the idea which was generated within the colonial system that traditional herbal medicines are suspicious. And indeed, when these samples of these medicines during Anas's investigation were taken to the Food and Drugs Authority in Ghana to be tested, they did not test for the active agent that these drugs contain, but they did a toxicology test. And a toxicology test to show that these medicines contain elements that are nocive or dangerous to humans. So it is already a test that is biased by saying that knowledge cannot come from there. And for that matter, the first test we need to do is a toxicology test, which is not the first criteria that you demand from a medicine anyway. Now, this framework also, I mean, it's also uh, a framework that is rigged with many bureaucratic challenges. I'll just mention a few. Many traditional healers who live in villages cannot even meet the requirements of the regulatory bodies in many countries to be able to get their medicines approved. You need to go to the capital. You need to be able to buy forms. You need to be able to carry the formula. You need to be able to explain. They cannot do so. And for that matter, their medicines will never become official. Secondly, there is also the question of I mean, intellectual property. And this is where, once again, even those of us who work in academia and do research sometimes claim knowledge from these people. And later on, we claim the intellectual property for this. And we need a better regulatory framework. And some of these, um, these, I mean, some of these um, cures actually belong to the people. So using a model of actually knowing who to give the intellectual property to is something that we need to revisit. It is not a person, it is a tradition, and a tradition belongs to a people. So who owns the intellectual property? And of course, there is also the question of underfunding of traditional herbal medicines. And once again, in the assimilating model, if you look at this, a country like Ghana, where there have been attempts really to integrate or to, uh, to bring um, traditional herbal medicine into mainstream healthcare. And in Ghana, we have a national health insurance scheme. The, national, the traditional cures and the traditional medicine do, does not receive the same support as Western biomedicine is not, I mean, receives from the national health insurance scheme. So this system is continually disfavored. And let me move quickly. What I'm trying to say is that we need to rethink our approach to traditional herbal medicine if we, are, if we would like to see a cure or for something like COVID-19 or a cure for diseases emerging out of Africa. And this is a task of decolonization. 
it will be very long for me to explain, but I'm just talking, I'm just going to mention three pillars that are necessary for, for us to be able to carry out this decolonization, just like map out an agenda, but I'm not going to go into all the contents of the agenda. One is the hegemonic uh, pillar. The hegemonic pillar simply means realizing that um, the more we keep depending on external sources to resolve our health problems, we will always be dependent. And it's a question of power and knowledge. And we should realize that it is about time we start taking control of our own health and investing in it, starting from our leaders. And secondly, the epistemic model. The epistemic pillar of decolonization means actually revisiting our whole concept of knowledge. It's knowledge only scientific knowledge. And what, are, what value should we give to other forms of knowledge, metaphysical knowledge, testimony, even spiritual knowledge? This is a, a conversation that we need to carry out in order to be able to give full value to what we have. And then thirdly, it's a commitmental approach. And that commitmental approach requires a change of mind, which takes off the bias that traditional or, I mean, uh, African traditional knowledge generating systems are not reliable. We need to believe, um, just imagine if we had already believed that, yes, with all the thousands of herbs and herbal cures that exist across the continent, if we believe that if looking into them, we will find some form of help to come out of COVID-19, perhaps we would have searched with more intensity. It's a commitment, it's an act of will. But since we do not believe, we will borrow money and buy medicines from outside. And when somebody from inside the continent even tries to say they have a cure, we give them such standards that they will not be able to meet. But the commitmental approach requires, especially those in authority, starting from the regulatory bodies to those of us in academia, making ourselves vulnerable and engaging more deeply with community in order to allow the wealth of experience. Because I mean, if human life has thrived in the, on the African continent for millions of years, it means that we do have some form of healthcare system. And I'll conclude by just saying that, I mean, uh, Kevin Marsh, uh, our Fox just published a paper where he told, he says, um, he's, he, they try to offer some of the explanations why the death rate of COVID-19 in Africa is so low compared to other regions of the world. And one of the things that emerges is that there are many factors and not enough research has been done. And the task, basically part of the decolonization is to understand this because if Africa is a success story in, uh, with regard to COVID-19 compared to other regions, in terms of health, then why are we not investing to understand well why this is taking place and see where, how perhaps we can share it with the rest of the world and we will then be exporting health. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very rich um, expose. Um, this would have really required much more time to do justice to, to all the, 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 the rich uh, the richness of your presentation and a lot of um, a lot to chew on there. Um, I have a number of questions, so we are going to move straight into your Q and A right now. The first question has various components. Um, so um, the African view of health Caesar that you have so eloquently described is similar to that which is now emerging in the global north. We increasingly seek to view people holistically. Can we say that Northern ideas of health are evolving towards an African understanding? And how do we move beyond an understanding of the world which has its origins in colonialism? Are there successful case studies of the integration of traditional medicine and biomedicine in Africa? So three questions in one for you, Cesar. 
Wow. Okay. Um, the first part of the question is this. I mean, there are some studies, um, for example, Emile, Emile Clotre has some work even on the history of the emergence of the current biomedical model in a country like France. So the emergence of this model, which we're using today, was not just only scientific, it was also political and a question of power. Because if we think about Europe, even in the Middle Ages, in the, in the medieval times in Europe, reading uh, Clotre, for example, or even Charles Taylor, one would see that there was a different vision of the world in which um, you know, other forms of, I mean, other considerations were taken into account when talking about health, spiritual dimensions, social dimensions. However, due to a change in culture, this model emerged and it was driven. Now, that model was later on exported to the African, to the African continent through the, colonial, um, the, colonial, the colonialists who arrived. The fact is that we are now actually arriving at a moment whereby we do realize that that model has its limitations. And I think um, it's not that the world is actually evolving to an African view. I think the world is simply realizing that the view that we have been using so far has its advantages and we have achieved a lot. I mean, people live longer and we live healthier lives. However, it also has its limitations. And in order to examine the limitations of this model, we need to look around and the African model can, can contribute, just like other historical models. Um, I think, I, have I answered all the questions? <laughs> Well, I think, yes, you, you have touched on them as far as I can see, but perhaps um, there's an element about what constitutes scientific knowledge. So you speak about hierarchies of knowledge and right. you know, what constitutes scientific knowledge. Can you say a little bit more about what African forms of knowing can contribute to our understanding of the world? Okay. Now, the thing is this. Um, I may have to go into a little, bit of, a little bit of epistemology here. We tend to think of sources, valid sources of knowledge as things that we can actually measure and things that are replicable. Yet, if we look at our own lives, we also see that we have other sources of certainty and sources of knowledge which do not meet that criteria. Um, one of the things I often, I uh, mean, this uh, dates back to Augustine. Um, Augustine talks about the fact that, I mean, the, the, the lady that they told me was my mother. Um, and in general, none of us really has an empirical proof normally to accept that our mother is our mother. Yet we actually build an existence on it. We often, we then look for the proof if there is doubt. So there are many things we go on, on testimony because others have told us so, and we can rely on that. Now, the question then is, how do we determine which, testimon which, uh, which testimonials are credible and who are not credible? So we can actually open the sources of knowledge beyond just empirical testing. That is one. Two, um, even we know that, and this is, this is, I think this is, this is clear, that even the way people respond physically to treatment varies, not just because of their, phys their physiology, but there are also psychological and non-measurable elements in terms of like empirical, physical, measurable elements that actually are at play. So the idea is, how can we begin to you know, factor these elements into, our, into what we consider what, I mean, the knowledge basket with which we are operating when we are working in healthcare? Okay, thank you. Yeah. In the interest of time, I'm going to ask just one more question because we need to leave time for the second talk. And um, is there a record or a repository of information about um, African traditional 
uh, medicine. Chinese herbal medicine is well documented. Is there something equivalent uh, for Africa? Yes, um, the um, Africa CDC is actually driving this, um, driving an effort to have a database um, and really have national I mean, collections of the herbal medicines that we do have. This effort is incomplete, very incomplete in many countries um, because one lack of funding, lack of means, and sometimes even just access is not easy. And it, I think even trying to follow the assimilation model, one of the most, one of the first things we ought to have done is basically to find out what cures are out there on the continent. What are people using? And once we have a full knowledge of that, then we can begin to see how we can improve upon that. However, many regulatory bodies in, in the various African countries are actually sitting down, waiting for people to come and present their cures, and then they will tell you whether it is valid and it can be distributed. And this is part of the commitmental decolonization that I was talking about. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> And um, we're going to pause there for now. Um, there's a possibility we might be able to come back to you and move on to our second presentation by Anne and um, Mora. Uh, Mora Terry Kale is the AFOC Student Engagement Liaison and works very closely with AFRISOC, that's the Oxford University Africa Society. She holds a bachelor's degree in international relations and philosophy from the University of Cape Town an MPhil in African Studies from Oxford. Mora is a Rhodes Scholar and is currently reading for a DPhil in Human Geography and is at Lineker College. Anne McKenna needs absolutely no introduction whatsoever, but for those who are engaging with us for the very first time, Anne is the coordinator of AFOX, which she set up a few years ago with Kevin Marsh, the AFOX director. Anne was a Rhodes Scholar and has a DPhil in Chemical Biology. She's a fellow at Somerville College. Uh, you will get to know her very soon. She is the heart and soul of our folks. And please take it away. So that's a very scary introduction. Thank you very much. Um, I feel like it was an investment of all my education when I was teaching. Um, I think I need to explain back my thesis before learning to print. Yeah. Could you put up your, your sound? We can't hear you very clearly, Anne. All right. How's it? Can you hear me now? Perfect, perfect. Fantastic. Now, I was just saying it's very interesting listening to uh, Caesar's talk and, and feeling like I need to go back and ask my thesis, um, having been a biomedical researcher for a while now. Um, so, for those of us who've engaged in Africa Oxford for a long while, uh, since we started, I'm going to apologize in advance. A lot of the things we're going to discuss things that are already very so your voice is fading in and out, and I think your microphone is probably not close enough to your mouth. Okay. Um, can you hear me well enough now? Absolutely. We can hear you from five miles away. <laughs> Great. So um, I was just saying that a lot of what we discussed right now would be familiar to those of us who have been in for a long while, but it might be new to um, people who have not uh, interested in that a lot. Or alternatively, some of the people might be new to people who've been with us but have not up on what's going on. So if you've heard, um, if you've heard this before, please bear with us. If you've not, welcome. There's a there's a there's a request, and that probably you should consider wearing your headphones. Okay, one second. How's it? Is that any better now? Brilliant. Okay. Uh, good. So um, if you can hear me better now, I'm just going to get started on what is I had just mentioned that 
some of you who have been engaging with us for a while might already be uh, familiar with a lot of the things that I was about to bear with us. Um, and for those of us who are engaging us for the first time, um, most welcome, and we are delighted that you could join us. So, what is AFOC? The Africa Oxford Initiative um, is a platform that really draws together across the university all research and academic interests that have a focus on Africa. The idea is to build this vision of making Africa a strategic priority for Oxford and as a result for other global institutions. We aim to do this by supporting equitable and sustainable partnerships between Oxford and African academics. Um, now, why focus on Africa? First, because I think it's brilliant. That's my very unbiased opinion. Uh, but also because with this, we know that there's been an extensive um, historical link between Oxford and various African institutions for good or for bad, and we acknowledge that. We also understand that this, um, the future of, of the world is indeed African, uh, given the demographic and social economic um, transition that's happening in the continent at the moment. Another, another um, thing that makes it important for us to focus um, particularly on Africa is um, because the continent heads of states have come together and, and built this vision of the Africa that we want that is predicated on knowledge-based economies. And for us to support knowledge-based economies, we need to think critically about how we engage in research um, and academic spaces in the continent. Well, of course, we do not let go of the good global citizenship um, agenda, which is good if that's your inclination. But there are very pragmatic reasons why a global institution like Oxford really does need to have a deliberate and a strategic focus um, uh, in, in Africa. Now, how do we go about our business? So there are three uh, sort of levels of, of interaction. Um, next slide. Um, there are three levels of interaction uh, from, from the previous slides. Um, there's a communication element, so showcasing all kinds of research and, and academic collaborations happening across um, the university that have a focus on Africa. There is the element of building new collaborations, and we do this through our travel grants and visiting fellowships, which we'll talk about in a minute. There is the element of building sustainability, so we don't leave a lot of unexpected links with our partners. Um, and, and this we do through senior fellowships and a few other programs that I will talk about. And the larger goal is really to uh, advance the research that comes from this collaborative project to become viable solutions for economic and, and development challenges in the continent. So um, if I will break this down a little bit to specific programs, uh, those of you who've been engaging with us, please bear with me. This is a familiar information. Um, one of our first sort of pioneering programs was the AFOC travel grant. These are small seed uh, grants that allow people to travel between Oxford and African institutions, and they go either way to allow people to start a conversation. Uh, there's only so much you can do through Zoom. Um, there's only so much you can do through virtual emails and, and so forth. And these grants allow people to meet across the table and really discuss, co-develop ideas, co-develop concepts that can later lead to um, longer term uh, research collaboration. Now, of course, the nature of this is going to change um, given COVID and, and given other concerns like climate change, uh, but we will keep we will keep you updated on any new arrangements with the AFOX travel grants. I, I need to add that this, because we're across um, university multidisciplinary platforms, these grants are, are for all sorts of research, all the way from astrophysics to theology and zoology. So these are, these are examples of some of the grants that we've awarded in the last few years. You can go to the website to learn more about that and take advantage of them. The other programs that we run include the African Visiting Fellowship, which this allows African academics to spend some time with Oxford collaborators within Oxford departments and colleges. So you have that dual um, benefit of being within the department and working on a very specific research project, but also being in a multidisciplinary um, you know, center within a college so you can be able to engage with students and academics to work on different things than you. So this, the aim of this is really to provide an opportunity to foster academic mobility and network building. And a lot of um, great results have come out of this eight-week fellowship uh, that happened in the summer. And, and one of the most important ones to highlight is the capacity for our fellows um, to, uh, to bring in their students in their partnerships and, and after they go back and still establish those collaborations that go on to support MSC and, and PhD students in their home institutions. And, and one of our you know, most success, one of our great success stories is Caesar who just made the presentation. Um, and 
if you want to know how to become an AFOC fellow, well, talk to Chris after this. Uh, we've made an extension of this, having noticed that uh, the, three, the, the, the eight weeks that we have fellows here work for some context but not in others, and started a senior visiting fellowship. This is for academics who are in, in, in later stages of their career to take a sabbatical, sit down and reflect on their career, build long term institutional linkages with Oxford so that the partnerships that we start don't just start and fade. So this allows for an engagement to up to one academic year. And we were we were very fortunate to have some exceptional, exceptional um, academics apply for our first round of senior visiting fellowships. And this, we're excited to have this, um, um, six scholars joining us this academic year. Um, some of them will be able to come to Oxford soon, others not so soon given COVID and, and, and everything that has been disrupted this year. But we hope that in, 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 in future we'll be able to position this so that they are more um, uh, sort of responsive to, to situations as they evolve. Now, um, after we've had those initial conversations and people have done some, some, some initial work and are interested in building uh, further collaborations, we, we saw a need to, to set up some sort of research grants that will facilitate uh, building of pilot data or extending research sites or setting up uh, larger um, research centers so people can be able to have funding to um, leverage you know, bigger, bigger research grants in, in future. And so the Research Development Award um, does this, and it provides some funding of up to 50,000 for academics who are in these collaborative uh, projects already, who've already been supported through the travel grant or through the visiting fellowship, to just power um, uh, the, 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 the research to move to a next level and, and put them in a, in a place where they can be able to attract major research funding. Now, the aim of really ASPOX is to embed this culture of equitable and sustainable partnerships in the university and with all our partners. And we do this by supporting the capacity sharing element. And notice I said capacity sharing, not capacity building. So to, build, to embed this capacity sharing element in other major research grants, including some of the ones that are listed here, but also in other networks, including you know, Oxford, India, and China, Africa, and so forth networks. And we hope that through the experience that we've had, through the incredible network that we've built over the years, we can be able to tap into this expertise and share our knowledge and share our, our, um, our resources so that we can be able to make this the way to go. Now, how far are we so far? It's been exactly four years, and we, Oxford AFOX doesn't quite have a, a launch date because conversations have been happening for about two, two years or so before we had any sort of formal launch. And our soft launch was October 2016, so this month we celebrate our fourth official birthday and we've seen a lot um, happen in those few years. The network has grown from a couple of people to over close to 3,000 active members. Our researcher database um, has about 300 Oxford academics and about double that um, of African academics. These are people who have a commitment to building research partnerships uh, between Oxford and African um, academics. We've supported over 200 um, travel grants. As I said, this is going to evolve given the COVID situation. Um, and we've seen new partnerships emerge between um, various departments and, and, and research centers within the university across over 30 African countries. Our capacity sharing elements through our visiting fellowships have supported um, close to 60 fellows in the last four years. We've had six senior fellows and these have advanced um, both the travel grants and visiting fellowships have advanced to um, research, about eight research grants so far. We are now moving to another phase, which is building the next generation of research leaders um, in the continent. And um, Mo Mo Mora, my friend and colleague Mora, will talk more about this. Uh, but it's really supporting uh, the next part of graduate um, researchers, graduate students from the continent, recognizing that um, the continent has over 27% of student age population. So for a university that's global as, as Oxford, we do need to have that global footprint. Um, and so we do this through various student engagement programs. And I think I want to stop there and welcome more, more in detail about our student program. But while I close, um, I want to encourage you all, whichever level you are in the research ecosystem, whether as a student, whether as an interested person, as an early career academic, junior academic, both in Oxford and in various African institutions, there is something that, that you can get engaged with in AFOX. And if there are things that you think we would be doing better or there are things that you think would be um, interesting
something for us to consider. We are always, our doors are always open and we'll be very keen to hear from you. Maura. Thank you, Anne. Uh, and as Anne mentioned, I'll be speaking about uh, AFOX's student engagement. Um, and something that Anne alluded to in the very beginning was that it's predicted that by 2050, the majority of the world's young population and student age population will be in Africa. And so this means that they have the potential to play a key role in research as well as in knowledge production and contribute to the future of the continent as well as the world. And so to help uh, realize the benefits of this potential, uh, AFOX works with departments departments, colleges, and scholarship committees across the university to maximize the opportunities that are available for prospective uh, African applicants uh, and to support students who are currently studying at the University of Oxford. So just to flag uh, the six people that you see on the slide right now are part of the um, African Graduate uh, Scholarship Program uh, that Anne mentioned, and it's something that I'll speak about um, in, in a few slides as well. So, when it comes to our focus on students, we take a multi-pronged approach by focusing on increasing applications, increasing offers, increasing funding, as well as supporting students who are currently in Oxford. So I'll highlight some of the events and the programs that we run to be able to achieve these aims. So in terms of increasing applications, every application cycle, we have a virtual admissions open day, which is a live streamed Q&A about the, I think what many people find to be a very daunting application process. And so we have a panel of students as well as people who work in admissions across the university answer questions about the various processes and stages of applying to Oxford. And in terms of student engagement, uh, AfroSoc is a key partner. And one of the things that they do is run the mentoring scheme uh, where they recruit current students uh, to mentor prospective applicants um, through the application process. So talk through their CV, their personal statements, as well as about like, managing uh, referees. And the way that we uh, partner with AfroSoc on that initiative is that uh, AFOX covers the application fees for those people who participate in this mentoring scheme. So there were 120 applicants who were mentored by 40 grad students last year, and AFOX was able to cover 42 applicants from seven different African countries um, in that program. So on the second uh, focus in terms of increasing offers, I think what I'd like to highlight for the moment is the summer placements for prospective uh, DFOL students. Uh, and last year, there were five African uh, students who came to Oxford to spend a little, bit, a little bit of time in the university over the summer. And it was an opportunity for them to experience the Oxford academic environment and also an opportunity to build networks with potential academic supervisors, as well as other academics and students that they might have the opportunity to work with when they're in Oxford. So on the point of increasing funding, going back to uh, the six students that you saw earlier, who I think all of them are in Oxford or most, most of them, if not already in Oxford. So uh, AFOX is working with, uh, working in partnership with the Standard Bank Chairman Scholarship um, and the Oppenheimer Fund to support the award of six graduate scholarships uh, for the 2020 to 2021 academic year. And one of those scholarships Scholarships is the inaugural AFOX Graduate Scholarship. And this was launched to further strengthen the opportunities that are available to African graduate applicants. So what's great about the, uh, the scholarship program is that it goes beyond covering just the course fees and the living expenses of students, but it will also deliver tailor-made training programs uh, for the scholars networking opportunities and make sure to support the scholars before, during and following their studies um, in Oxford. And then finally, on the student uh, front, I will talk a little bit about the student programs that we run for students who are in Oxford currently studying. And the first way that we support them is academically through the essay writing workshop. 
as well as through the MPhil and DPhil roundtable. So the essay writing workshop is an opportunity for students to discuss with Oxford academics as well as um, senior DPhil students um, and former students how to write an Oxford essay because we recognize that adjusting to a new academic environment can be challenging and this is one of those ways in which we try to help students adjust to the writing style uh, in Oxford. And for research students in particular, uh, masters and PhD students, we have the round table where it's an opportunity for them to talk to, to other research students as well as academic staff about the process of doing independent research in Oxford. So we'll speak about things like your personal well-being, key milestones during your research, um, as well as managing your relationship with your supervisor. And so just to flag that the essay writing workshop um, will be happening uh, in week one of Michaelmas term on Friday the 16th at 4.30. Um, so do look out for that if you're on the FOX mailing list for information on how to register. Uh, and then the next uh, way that students are supported is through the uh, African Graduate Thrive Fund or the Hardship Fund. And this is an award of up to £500 that is aimed to support um, students to pursue activities that will ensure their academic excellence or to cover um, unexpected um, and urgent financial circumstances. And all the information that you'll need, this is open to students currently studying at the university of Oxford and all the information that you'll need about that is on the AFOX website. And the other way that we engage with students is through our uh, graduate mixer, which we usually hold in the beginning of term. Unfortunately, we won't be able to host one this term due to restrictions around the pandemic, um, but we hope that we will be able to do something with students, provide an environment where new students, um, former students um, and staff can interact with one another in a more informal environment as a way to build community and again to create networks. So I've spoken about uh, all the programs, well three of the programs on this page, and I think the last one I'll highlight is the Graduate Symposium, which is student-led um, and it's a, a dedicated space um, that's meant for highlighting the academic academic contributions of uh, students and researchers um, uh, at Oxford on Africa. And it's also a very unique platform for students and researchers to present uh, their research to a multidisciplinary audience and also an opportunity to kind of practice um, presentation skills for, for graduate students. So that's uh, all of the information on, on students, um, but there are, of course, events that are open to anybody um, who has an interest in Africa. And one of those is the Nsaka, which I won't go into because I think Watu introduced the Nsaka uh, quite nicely in the, in the beginning. And I hope that uh, people who are new will continue to tune into the Nsaka. Uh, but what we have annually as well is the FORA, the Focus on Research Africa, which happens uh, every year in Trinity term. And it's again an event that we weren't able to have uh, last the last academic year, but we hope to be able to have it this year. And the FORA is a multidisciplinary platform for researchers and students to share their ideas and solutions on a range of challenges as well as opportunities facing the continent. And this is another area in which students can get involved by showcasing their research through post through poster presentations as well. So do uh, look out for information about Fora. Uh, and there are also events that are facilitated by AFOX on the continent as well. Uh, the machine learning in Daba in Stellenbosch, South Africa and Nairobi, Kenya, which really just aims to have build an AI and machine learning community across the continent. And then there were multiple um, AFOX networking events across different cities uh, in the continent as well. So if you want to keep up with what's happening in AFOX and make sure that you don't miss any of these events. Make sure that you sign up to the mailing list and continue to come uh, to tune into the digital and suckers. Um, and again, please uh, ensure that you encourage African graduates to apply to Oxford, particularly through the channels that we've spoken about today. Um, and if you're a researcher, really look into 
the programs and resources that are offered for Africa Oxford partnerships. And of course, do spread the word about AFOX uh, and share the joy on all the opportunities and events that are available. And the way that you can reach us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, uh, and everything that we've spoken about today is also available on the website. Uh, thank you, Watu. Thank you very much, um, Mora and Anne. We have a little a bit of time for questions and um, perhaps we will ask Mora for a bit, five more minutes in case there are people who are able to stay on longer and, um, and engage us um, about our folks. Now, Mora, very quickly, you gave a very sort of clear um, uh, explanation of how AFOX engages with AFRISOC. Of course, the two are, are distinct and different, but work together very closely. Uh, perhaps you might want to say something about how people might be able to join AFRISOC and how that might be useful to them. But also importantly, you might want to point out that you've put together a very useful practical document on top tips for African students in Africa and how people might be able to get hold of that. Okay, yes. Uh, so if you would like to join the AfroSoc group, you could find them on social media. Um, but there's also a Telegram uh, group that you can join, which you will be able to find the link to join on social media as well. Um, and if you can find us in social media, we can, lead, we can kind of point you in the right direction of where to get in contact uh, with AfroSoc. And yes, in conjunction with AfroSoc, we've also uh, put together a, a guide for students who are coming to Oxford, which is uh, a little bit more informal and colloquial, and we hope uh, uh, kind of helps you to get to, to grips with your new surroundings. Uh, and that guide is on the AfroSoc website uh, as well. Okay. Before I give you a break, Mora, um, a quick question. How do students make time to take these extra activities while trying to study? Is it possible? Or is there any support for mental health for students? Okay, yes, it is possible. Uh, I think what I will say is that uh, Oxford can be incredibly overwhelming in terms of the amount of things that you can do and that are available. And so from my perspective, I think a good thing to do would be to kind of decide from the very beginning what are the sorts of things that you're interested in what you're open to and those are the things that you'll prioritize and don't try to go to everything don't try to do everything because that's not <laughs> possible um, but stay open to things but don't feel bad if you feel like you can't make um, every event and do every single thing uh, on the me mental health front uh, there is information some information in the student guide as well about where you can access mental health. So the university does have uh, mental health support where you can get sessions, um, counseling sessions for free at the University Counseling Centre. Uh, there's also a few colleges and departments that offer a mindfulness courses. So it's worth finding out whether that's available from your college. But of course, I'll also highlight that um, mindfulness is not a substitute um, for therapy. Um, and so if that's what you need, then definitely do make contact um, with the university counseling uh, services. Thank you, Mora. Anne, researchers in the UK are increasingly encouraged to tackle global challenges. What role can an initiative like AFOX play in leading and facilitating research? Well, um, I think it, it is that premise, in fact, that made AFOX uh, come together uh, because it was the realization that um, increasingly um, uh, global problems are no longer resource specific. Our problems are not Africa specific or Oxford specific. So if we are going to solve any problems in the world, we have to think more collaboratively. Collab collaboratively. So, um, and so uh, AFOX, what AFOX can contribute is two, two things really. One is to highlight what kinds of different work people are doing through our researchers' database. When people sign up to the database, they're able to know who is doing what, where, and, and start a conversation with somebody based on the work that they've, they've already uh, been doing. So you can find people whose skills you can complement and so forth. And the second is through our research grants, um, uh, small grants through the travel grant to facilitate people to meet um, and, and, and have conversations with that. I think the thing that makes it really powerful is, is the convening power that AFOX, uh, AFOX members have afforded us so far. 
through our events, through our various activities, you're able to meet uh, with, with colleagues from across uh, departments and divisions that you would otherwise not have interacted with. And so you're able to have a new way, a new perspective of looking at global problems. Um, I think the other thing is the advantage uh, of, of being in close collaboration with the African Academy of Science. And so we have sort of our ear on the ground um, and, and they, the, the, the partnership with the African Academy of Science enables us to um, support people from, from all sorts of parts of the continent who want to engage with Oxford, but at the same time, gives us an in for people who want to work with colleagues across the continent that we are able to signpost them um, to, the, to the right places to even start the conversation. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'd like you to give us a parting shot. Um, I think Maura has already done that. She's told the students that um, enjoy yourself as much as you can. And most of all, don't try to do everything, remain sane. So before you give us yours, there's a question that's come up more than once. Maybe we can get your take on it as well. What is the difference between AFOX and AFRISOC? Okay, so AFRISOC is a student-led organization. It's Oxford Africa a Student um, Society, but it's student-led. It's one of the largest student-led organizations across the UK, it focuses on African issues as well. Um, AFOX works very closely with AFRISOC. In fact, uh, the AFRISOC chairperson is part of our steering board, and we're also involved very directly with them uh, through the student programs that we've just mentioned. AFOX, on the other hand, is a platform that works with researchers and academics and supports particularly academic and research collaborations in Oxford and African institutions. Um, this includes both the, the students facing programs, but also the academic and researchers facing programs as well as policy engagement and, and government engagement work. So we, uh, we work a little bit broader in our remit and we are very, very grateful that we get to work with AFRISOC on, on all, the, all our student facing programs and other programs as well. I hope that makes a clarification. Yes, that, yeah. And uh, a last word from you in half a dozen words. Half a dozen words. Um, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of um, scope for people to engage with, with various uh, part of the research ecosystem. So wherever you are, either as a student, either as an early career researcher, senior researcher, is an opportunity for you to engage and, and build this culture of equitable and sustainable partnerships. So come join us. We'd be delighted to have you. Right. Um, we've gone over the time and thank you all for, you know, giving us a bit more time to, to finish off here. There are obviously more questions uh, for both Anne and Mora, and also some very technical questions for Caesar, which I'm afraid we'll not be able to tackle today. Um, thank you very much, panel, for being here with us today. Uh, that will be all uh, from us today. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. We shall look forward to seeing you again next month. And that will be all for, from us today. Thank you. Bye-bye.